For the past six years, I've been working at the intersection of art and activism, producing large-scale installations that engage thousands of people to act on behalf of a social cause. And in doing this work, it's become so clear to me that art is an incredibly powerful tool with which to engage a community and to connect people with issues in personal and profound ways. The current project that my team and I are working on is called One Million Bones. My background is in art and photography, and as a visual learner, I'm constantly constructing images in my mind of the information I consume. And many times, those images have stayed with me and moved me to do something with that information. The vision for one million bones to be laid on the National Mall in Washington, D.C., came out of reading Philip Gorovich's book on the Rwandan genocide. We wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families. It was one of the most gut-wrenching, haunting books I've ever read. And it was reading his descriptions of what happened in Rwanda, all the while knowing there was a genocide happening in Sudan and a conflict that had been going on in Congo for years that made me want to bring the image I had made of his words into my part of the world, to make that image real for me and for people living in the U.S. One Million Bones is a social arts practice. That means we use education, hands-on art making, and public installations. And we do that to raise awareness about genocide and mass atrocities happening in Sudan, Congo, Burma, and Somalia. Our vision is to collect a million handmade bones from people all over the world and install them on the National Mall next year as a symbolic mass grave and visible petition. By combining art and education, we've been able to introduce this really difficult topic. And this approach allows for people of all ages to learn more without having them turn away paralyzed from information they feel both disconnected to and overwhelmed by. The action of creating a bone after learning about these conflicts is important and can be the first critical step of bringing an activist into this movement. I've been thinking a lot about an Edmund Burke quote, all it takes for evil to prevail is for good men to do nothing. We never cease to be amazed at how many adults and students don't know what genocide is, let alone that it happens today, or how we as consumers, investors, and voters directly contribute to these conflicts. Through our curriculum and workshops, we've been able to educate and inspire thousands of people to find a voice on these issues. And last year, we have made a partnership with a group called Students Rebuild, so that every bone that's made now generates a dollar donation toward Care International's work in Somalia and Congo, up to $500,000. It is a powerful experience to create a bone and to consider the depth of that symbol. I've made hundreds of bones, but the one that's most meaningful is this one that I made with a woman named Ashta in mind. She's my exact age and lives in Chad with her family. And when I made this pelvis, and even when I look at it, I'm reminded of so many things, of life, birth, beauty, the fragility of all of that. And I'm also reminded of death and the very thin line between the two. I think of the four children who Ashta lost on her, her journey from Sudan into Chad and in the refugee camp where she lives. I think of her five other children who are still alive and how her pelvis holds all of that. These bones were meant to carry those stories, to attest to the gravity of these crises on individual lives. But they are most significant as a symbol of our human connection and a reminder that we belong to each other, which is such an important message because when we accept the idea that we belong to each other, we recognize our responsibility to each other. And that's what I regard most in this work, experiencing art's capacity to bring issues, no matter how close or far away they are from us, home. And whether home is a place, a family, a freedom, or an idea, it's what we value more than anything else. And it's what we value that we'll fight to protect. Last Saturday, we had 35 installations in 35 state capitals, all volunteer organized and created. And it was beautiful to imagine these communities laying these bones in solidarity around this issue. In this past year, we produced two installations of 50,000 bones in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and New Orleans, Louisiana. And this is a video from our Albuquerque event. Mm -hmm. 
1996, that's when I lost my father. And then in 1998, I lost my brother and my two nephews. And then uh, my friends, uh, our neighbors, pastors, uh, you know, all those pe I knew all those people who, who, who got killed that same night. that I have is not about uh, 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 revenge, it's not about that. So if we have to think of revenge, then this is not a solution. All we need is forgiveness and um, thinking of the future, like what do we need as a Congolese so our kids, our younger brother, our brothers, the new generation will not go through what we've been through. I mean, you really don't do something until you know something then that's what a one million bones is doing to let people know what is going on in Congo, in Sudan, in Birma, in the other countries. Keep uh, talking about it, like the message is, if the message can keep going so people can do something about it. One of the most significant moments for me in this project came from an exchange I had that day with one of our presenters, Kigabu Mbatimatima. He's a refugee from Congo and a survivor of the Katumba massacre in Burundi. And an hour after we had started laying the bones down, he was ahead of me on the road, and he turned around and told me he had to go back to his room. And so I offered to drive him, and he said, no, I'm going to walk. And so I offered to walk with him, and he said, no, that's OK. I just have to go back to my room and be by myself. I need to cry for a little while. It's just so hard. And I very awkwardly said that I was sorry, that I would never want to make this harder on him. And I asked him if there was anything about it that he felt was uncomfortable or wrong or offensive in any way. And he said, no, Naomi, that's not it. But you have to understand, we lost so many people. And we never saw what happened to those people. And in your mind, you want to believe they're somewhere else but I saw them today, and that's just so hard. But we have to face it. Everyone has to face it. That same month we laid those bones in Albuquerque, three new mass graves were found in Sudan. In the fall last year, I went to New Orleans to work on this project, and what I found is that New Orleans is one of the most violent cities in our country. So when we brought this project into community centers and classrooms, a lot of the discussions drew from the students' personal experience. And these were incredibly honest and personal discussions. And as the students learned about the conflicts and violence happening on the scale they are in Sudan and Congo and Burma, they felt a deep connection and empathy. They crafted their bones from their own stories and to honor the stories of those living far away. And I was blown away by how many showed up on a Saturday last month when we laid 50,000 down. New Orleans was a major port in the U.S. for the African slave trade. And at the time, enslaved Africans living in the city would get one day a week to themselves. And most of them would go to Congo Square, where they would drum and dance. And the story is that you could hear that sound reverberate throughout the entire city. So when we laid the, the bones down in Congo Square, it was to the sound of drumming. And the leader of the drum circle, Baba Luther, has worked with his partner, Jamilia, for 30 years to keep that sacred space recognized and cradled. We asked Jamilia to lay the first bone that day. It took her three attempts, as that short journey to carry the bone brought her back both to the history of her ancestors, which she's fought so hard to keep present in her community's mind, and to the deep connection she felt to those living far away in conflict. 
Baba Luther said in all his 30 years working in that space, he had never seen anything so powerful and that he'd be bringing these drums to DC next year. This is part of the challenge of working at the intersection of art and activism. Neither field will embrace what we do entirely, and yet both fields are striving to elicit this kind of deep down in your gut response, because it's that kind of response you can turn into sustained action and activism. I'm not advocating that art is the solution to all of our issues, but I do recognize that a lot of our movements need more activists and that we need as many things as possible to inspire a new generation and to reawaken and stir an older one. And that's something I've seen an artistic vision do, inspire people to imagine and dream that a different reality is possible, which is what we call hope, the most important thing in this room, because without it, there'd be no reason for any of us to even be here. Thank you so much.